pure gold Breathed by His fire My heart's one desire Is to be Blessed Sunday morning. Psalm 25, 67 says, Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindness, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth nor my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that if it wasn't for your tender mercies and your loving kindness, we would all be lost. Let us acknowledge that we are sinful creatures that only are saved because of your grace and mercy. Thank you, Lord God, for your goodness and your love for us. We thank you, Lord, for the birthday celebrants this week. We lift up to you the young men, Joshua and Nico, Lord. Help them, Lord, to align their wills to your will. May they seek your guidance in what they think, do, and say. May they take action to use, your, to use the talents and the gifts that you give them to serve their families and others, and especially towards you. 
We lift up to you, Jojo, oh Lord God. Thank you, Lord, so much for giving him another year. Continue to give him both physical and spiritual strength. You know how hard he works and how he works with many people as a physical therapist. Help him, O oh Lord, to use his life as a powerful witness to those around him. Thank you again, Lord God, for this opportunity to worship you. And we ask all of these things for your glory, honor. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue our series in the Minor Prophets, so let's review starting with Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Last week we talked about being willing to go through the cleansing process, the fire, the purification process, so that just like gold, the more that we are tested, heated. The refiner is able to take away more and more of our imperfections out so that at the end of the process we're able to reflect Jesus in our lives. But what should I do? What should we do with our attitude? Or how, how should our perspe perspective be now that we are, and if we are, in the cleansing process? in the fire, again, in that purification process. And it's not going to be fun at all. Now, think about this. What would be some negative things that people do when they go through that some, that, through some kind of fire, some kind of storm in their life? How would they react? How would they act? Any guesses? Think about your life. How would you? How did you react? How did you um, act during those times of storms? Those times when you were, or it was not, it wasn't a pleasant uh, experience. How did you react? How, how was your perspective during those times? Many people would complain. They, 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 they play the blame game. They start yelling. They start name calling. They start arguing at a point that is not really the main point. They start comparing. I remember playing a pickleball this past week. We played mixed doubles. And I, I, I just met my partner since she was new to the area. And the normal game of pickleball is usually up to, to about 11 points and as we played at one time the score was 3 to 1 then 4 to 1 and we were losing and in, in, in mixed doubles not always but one of, the, one of the goals is to hit to the weaker partner and guess what my opponents were doing they were mostly hitting to my partner and she kept on making mistakes over and over and over again and I told myself it's okay we can still catch up I admit I made some of those mistakes as well but definitely not as much as her five to one six to one one sports writer named Haywood Braun said this sports don't build character they reveal it my male opponent was pretty good and he would drive the ball right at me at some times 
And it was like a way for him to show his dominance over me. At least that's how I felt. And uh, there was, you know, there was, it was, it was getting worse. And I really wanted to win. And it wasn't happening. 7-1, 8-1, 9-1. I mean, there were so many things, negative things I could have done if I wasn't a Christian. For example, I could have played the blame game. I could have told her, you know what, okay. You know why we're losing? I could have told this to my opponent. Not my opponent, my partner. I could have said this to my partner. You know why we're losing? It's because of you. You're the reason. Because of you, it's your fault. You know, I could have also said this to her. You know what? You want to help this team? Okay, here's what you do. You go stand in the corner well, I do all the work, all right? Just let me do it. Just let me handle it. I could have said that to her. And, you know, and it wasn't fun when you're down 9 to 1. But that's how it, that's how it is at times in life. In, in life, you can't always win all the time. You have your good times and you have bad times. And those bad times that will truly show your character. But what should our attitudes be when we, when we have those desires to complain, to complain, to, to blame, yell, and scream at the other person? You know, it's, it's my goal today that as you find a godly perspective, a biblical perspective, hopefully you can also help, this could also help you through those times. As we get into our passage today, found in Zechariah 14, 1 to 15. Zechariah 14, 1 to 15, I'll be using the New Living Translation. Now verses 1 to 2. But before we get into 1 and 2, we always got to remember context, context, context. Zechariah is prophesying at a time right now about a about in an a moment in time way in the future after the great tribulation and before the second coming of Jesus again after the great and destructive and horrendous great tribulation between the, between that and and after that and before the second coming of Jesus just like last week all right, so that's kind of the context, that's the timeline that I want you to remember. Now, verses 1 and 2. Watch for the day of the Lord is coming when your possessions will be plundered right in front of you. Again, this people, this God is talking to the people of Jerusalem. I will gather all the nations to fight against Jerusalem. The city will be taken, the houses looted, and the women raped. Half the half of the population will be taken into captivity and the rest will be left among the city uh, left among the ruins of the city about a month ago I, I remember I shared with you about how nations will go after the smallest this, uh, will go after Jerusalem and relatively speaking Jerusalem or Israel is so small but many nations around Israel, Jerusalem, will go after them. Before it gets better, I'm just letting you know, it's going to get worse. Especially in the case for Jerusalem, God's city for His chosen people. What's going to happen? Houses looted. Women raped. And half the population will be in captivity, will be taken into captivity, and the rest will be in ruins in the city. This is part of the cleansing process. The time of fire, the purification process. I mean, it's going to be devastating. It will be very discouraging, and a feeling of hopelessness will spread. 
The enemy is, is going to have that winning mentality. They feel like it's a 9 to 1 game, their favor. For the people, it seems like there's no hope in sight. I'm sure there are people there complaining and playing the blame game against God, maybe against others. And they'll start yelling and screaming at God and others as well. When you see a losing team start yelling at their own team members, you know frustration has sunk in. God's people don't know what to do. There's no escape for them. Again, no light at the end of the tunnel. But look what happens next. Verse 3 to 4. Then the Lord will go out to fight against those nations as he fought in times past. On that day his feet will be will on his day on that day his feet will stand on the mount of olives east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will split apart, you know, like a, like a fault line, making a wide valley running from east to west. Half the mountain will move to toward the north and half towards the south. Now, this is the same Mount of Olives where Jesus last descended and went up to heaven. Isn't that wonderful how, how appropriate it is for him to come back at the same place where he last left. And to make the grandest entrance, first of all, there will be a monumental earthquake that will literally move mountains. That's pretty powerful for, for an earthquake to move mountains. Uh, by the way, according to JewishRoots.net, Israel, this is just, just I believe last year, According to JewishRoots.net, Israel is located all along the Great Rift Valley, which runs for about 4,800 kilometers between Syria to Mount Mozambique and passes through the Dead Sea below Jerusalem's eastern hills. Now, there's an earthquake fault that lies near Mount of Olives like it says in Zechariah 14.4. So therefore, according to Zechariah 14.4, uh, okay, and the Mount of Oz will split apart. That's like a fault line. That is a fault line. And this was written about 520 BC. And there's evidence now, again, in today, that there's a fault line right there near the Dead Sea. As you can see here in the, is the map here, running east to west. Verse 5a, you will flee through this, this valley, for it will reach across Azel. Yes, you will flee as you did from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah of Judah. Now the earthquake will be so terrifying that they will run, they will flee to a nearby place called Azel. And now similar to, the, similar to what they remembered from their history, from Jewish history, is that the, there was a great earthquake of King Uzziah. And it's, it was that monumental that they remember that. And this going to be huge, it's going to be incredibly, incredibly powerful. Verse 5b. So then the Lord, my God, will come, and all His holy ones with Him. On that day, the sources of light will no longer shine. That means the sun and the moon, they'll no longer shine. Why? Yet there will be continuous day. Only the Lord knows how this could happen. There will be no more, there will be no normal day and night, where at evening time, it will still be light. I believe God's presence will be so bright, so bright that it will be continuous day, even during the evening hours. Verse 8. On that day, life even waters will flow from Jerusalem. 
half toward the Dead Sea and half toward the Medita Mediterranean, flowing continuously in both summer and winter. Now, according to the Institute of Creation Research, listen to how how special Jerusalem is as far as far as nature is concerned for them. Even though Jerusalem is surrounded by desert areas, yet for some reason, presently, temperatures are much cooler and bountiful rainfall occurs in this area. The average annual rainfall in northern Israel and along the highlands typically exceeds 15 inches. These proportions of Israel produce plentiful, for some reason, this, uh, this portion of Israel produce plentiful crops of citrus, uh, olives, figs, and grain. Far, be, far from being a desert, this part of Israel highly is productive. For some reason, they still get all the en enough rain and the temperatures are right that they're able to produce this much crops. For some reason, we don't know why. Very interesting how God has blessed Jerusalem in this way. And now in the future, water will flow towards the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea from Jerusalem. Again, something God only can do. Verse 9. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, there will be one Lord. His name alone will will be worshipped. Finally, finally, the whole world in all history, on this day, they will understand that Jesus is Lord. Finally, first time in all world history, they will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Philippians 2, 10 to 11 says this, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and every tongue shall con should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father finally and it takes place at that moment and look how powerful the earthquake will be that God uses in the future and how God will use this earthquake to not only be used to show his great power but also as a construction tool. A construction tool. Listen, verse 10 and 11. All the land from Geba, north of Judah, to Rimon, south of Jerusalem, will become one, one a vast plain. Everything will be flattened. All these valleys will be flattened. But Jerusalem will be raised up in its original place and will be inhabited all the way from the Benjamin Gate over to the site of the Old Gate, then to the Corner Gate and from the Tower of Henanel to the King's wine presses. And Jerusalem will be filled, safe at last, never again to be cursed and destroyed. Again, God's going to use earthquakes. All the areas around Jerusalem will no longer be valleys, but one vast plain, and at the same time, Jerusalem will be raised up in its original place. It's incredible how God can use nature for His purpose again. And Jerusalem will be filled, save at last, never yet to be cursed and destroyed. God is preparing the earth for the millennial reign of Jesus. Verse 12 and 15. I'm going to put 12 and 15 together because they're, they talk about the same thing. Alright? And the Lord will send a plague on all the nations that fought against Jerusalem. Their people will become like walking corpse, corpses. Corpses. Their flesh rotting away. Their eyes will rot in their sockets. And their tongues will not, will rot in in their mouths. This same plague will strike the horses, mules, camels, donkeys, and all the other animals in the enemy's camp. 
I'm going to read to you from the New King James Version, verse 12. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. Think about that. What does that sound like to you? What does that sound like? According to Pastor J. Vernon McGee, he writes this, A plague will be so sudden and so deadly that the flesh of Israel's enemies will rot while they are standing on their feet. It's almost like, it almost sounds like some kind of nuclear blast that will leave the flesh, eyes, and tongues of Israel's armies festering with wounds and rotting on the battlefield. Doesn't it sound like that? A nuclear war, a uh, nuclear explosion? Verse 13. On that day they will be terrified, stricken by the Lord with great panic. And because of the, so much panic, they will begin to fight their neighbors, their allies, hand to hand. God will send a panic that the, that the enemies will begin to fight each other. Now, what Old Testament story does this sound like? What Old Testament story does it sound like? It sounds like the story of Gideon. Remember the story of Gideon? 300 fighting men against the, the numerous enemies. How many were there? Were his enemies at that time? Judges 7, 12 says this, And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. Now, now are those good odds? 300 to one source that I read, 135,000 135, soldiers. Those are not good odds. But God made the enemies of Gideon panic. Remember with what? They used trumpets, torches, and pots. No, no uh, military weapons whatsoever. And the enemies started to fight each other. That's what's going to happen with Jerusalem. At this, uh, at, at the time uh, in the future, Jerusalem's enemies will start fighting each other for some reason when God causes that pa panic. Verse fourteen. Judah too will be fighting at Jerusalem. The wealth of all the neighboring nations will be captured. Great quantities of gold and silver and fine clothing. Again, from Pastor McGee, he says this regarding this passage here. God's people will show superhuman valor to fight on the part of the remnant of Judah. So valiant will be the fighting of the, of the Jews that into their hands will fall gold, silver, and apparel in great abundance. The hoard of goods and wealth will be enormous. In that day, Christ will be king over all the earth and none left to challenge his person, his work, his law, his rule. Righteousness and justice will at last. And truth and mercy and beauty will be, in order, will be the order of the day. Gone will be the filth, the evil, the injustice, the unrighteousness, and the rule of tyrants, dictators, and de despots of wickedness. They're all pass away. They're all be gone. God will be preparing earth for Jesus' millennial reign. Now for the application of this passage here. According to Bible.org, regarding the time before the, the Lord took over, I'm sure many of the Jews 
were discouraged. Many of them felt hopeless because of all the persecution that they were facing when all the nations were going after Jerusalem. And as for us, when we go through those trials, when we go through the fire, sometimes we, are, we can be tempted at this point. We look around and it seems like the bad guys are winning. For example, the guy at work who cheats and lies but still gets the promotion. You're honest and you come out the loser. Worldly people spend their time and money pursuing pleasure and seem to live pretty well. At the same time, you obey God, give your money to, the, to His kingdom, and you seem to have problem after problem. Like the guy in Psalm 73, you wonder, what's going on here? The wicked forsake God and prosper? I follow God and am chastened every day. I mean, at those situations, you're, you're tempted to join the other side. But God warns us. Don't be deceived. Even if you suffer persecution or martyrdom, you will be blessed because God's side is going to win in the very end. Amen to that? Amen? We're going to win at the very end. Don't give up. You may be thinking, okay, Sam, that's easy to say, but how do you know for sure that these prophecies will literally come true? What if, I, what if I deny myself and suffer for Christ's sake, but He never comes back? What if I put all my hope in heaven, in this belief, but it isn't true? You know, the, the, there are good reasons within the book of Zechariah. According, again, this is according to Bible.org. There are good reasons within the book of Zechariah for, for, for staking your life on these prophecies. Listen to these things. Again, according to just purely for the book of Zechariah. Zechariah has given us many specific prophecies about the first coming of Jesus that were literally fulfilled. He predicted that Jesus would come to Jerusalem, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a cult, the foal of a cult. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy on Palm Sunday. Again, this is, uh, this is prophesied in Zechariah. Zechariah also prophesied that Jesus would be rejected by the nation, sold for 30 pieces of silver, and that money would be thrown into potter, the potter in the house of the Lord. Judas Iscariot precisely fulfilled that prophecy in his betrayal of Jesus. The point is, if Zechariah could prophesy precisely these events about Christ's first coming 500 years in advance, shouldn't we also believe that he's accurate in predicting the details about Christ's second coming? Especially when, these predict when his predictions line up with many other scriptures. So when it seems as if as if evil is winning. Don't be deceived. Don't switch sides. Jesus is coming quickly and His reward is with Him. Brothers and sisters, don't give up. Especially when you're struggling, when you're going through the, that fire, when you're in the middle of the, that cleansing process, when you just want to give in to your emotions, when you want to give in to your feelings, when you get, want to give in to your sinful nature, don't give up. Those are the times, you know, I'm sure those are those times you want to start complaining, you want to start blaming others, you want to start blaming God possibly, or start, start arguing unnecessarily. I mean, I'm, I'm sure the early church felt the same way when they were being mistreated when they're being taken advantage of. That's why Paul says this. 
Philippians 2, 14 and 16 says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among, the, among them like stars in the sky, as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then, it will be a, and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Paul was basically saying to them, It's okay. Go through the fire. It's okay to, be, to feel the heat. It's part of the refining process. But also remember, there's a purpose. Remember, it will not be in vain so that we may all rejoice in the day of Christ. Christ will come back. Not only will He come back, He will at the end of it all be victorious. Yes, He will be victorious. Amen? We will be in the winning team at the very end, no matter how bad the score may look, no matter how hard and hopeless it may look, it may feel, no matter how, how bad it will feel, how the odds according to the world standards may be maybe a billion to one to win. It doesn't matter. But I want you to remember, Jesus will win. Therefore, since we are part of God's family, God's team, we will win also. Brothers and sisters, don't get discouraged. Stay calm. Don't get distracted by the score, by what you see, by what you're feeling. By the way, did I tell you how the, the pickleball game ended? We won. 12 to 10. We went into a tiebreaker and won. It doesn't always end in a happy ending. We may not always win the battle, but it doesn't matter. We will win the war. Yes, you'll have losses here and there, a sickness here, a discouragement there, whatever it is. Frustration here and frustration there. That's part of life. There will be different battles and we'll, we, won't, we won't always win the battles. But for the follower of Christ, the true believer in eternal life, there will always be not just a happy ending, but a joyous ending and a very victorious ending. Brothers and sisters, don't give up. Stay on course. Press on. Remember, we are victorious because we have Jesus. Let us pray. And Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord God, that we have that hope. And because we have that hope, oh Lord God, when we go through those storms, Lord God, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to remember it's okay. It's okay. Just give us that courage and that faith and that drive, Lord, with the help of your Holy Spirit to go through those, uh, those times of fire, to go through those storms, knowing, Lord God, at the very end of it all, we will be victorious. Especially, Lord God, because of what you did on the cross. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross. May we live for you, Lord God, out of love for you. In Jesus' name, Amen.
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you.